This video is for those of you who have HPV only. In other words, you don't have any dysplasia, you don't have any abnormal cells, all you have is H, HPV or human papillomavirus. Now I'm making this distinction because although treatment is similar, so whether you have HPV only or whether you have HPV and some level of dysplasia, you know, there's gonna be some overlap in the treatment there, especially when you're looking at uh, supplements and diet and things like that. But yeah, I want to make a distinction because it, it really underscores what you really want to be thinking about when you approach HPV, especially since it's so common and so many people have recalcitrant or chronic infections. So there are two things that you want to do or that you need to do with HPV. And again, I'm talking only, you know, HPV only. Two things you want to do. First, you want to get rid of it. That may seem self-evident, everybody wants to get rid of it, um, but to get rid of it, you're primarily focusing on immune system function. Um, the second thing that you wanna do is prevent malignant transformation. You wanna prevent dysplastic change. Now, you know, it, it's, you, you'd think the most important thing to do is to get rid of the HPV, and, and obviously that's what everybody wants to do, is to get rid of the HPV, but at the end of the day, you could live out your entire life with HPV and never have a problem with it. The only problem with HPV is if it causes cancer. So that's really the only, the, the only real concern or, or it should be the main concern with HPV is that it can cause cancer. But for the fact that it causes cancer, there's no issue really with HPV other than sort of um, just the psychosocial aspect. And, and you know, the psychosocial aspect is not talked about you know, very much. Maybe it is on forums and, and when people have conversations about it, I suppose it is. But with doctors, um, it's not typically talked about. And, and the psychosocial is just feeling like you have an STD, you know, feeling like you're tainted and, um, you know, for future relationships. You know, I, I see this a lot and I hear this a lot. Women who are really stressed out, um, I say women, I mean obviously there's some men that have HPV infections and know it, but that's, men are not typically tested, so that's not typically the issue yet. Um, but um, you know, most women are really stressed out about the fact that they have what's, you know, really is considered a sexually transmitted disease, despite the fact that it's not only sexually transmitted, but um, you know, stressed out about the fact that here you have this and then you have a moral dilemma, or may have a moral dilemma, of whether you tell future partners and um, you know, so there's that aspect of it, this, this ethical, moral dilemma of whether you should tell people that, you know, you might, you know, you have an STD in effect. Um, and then there's the fear component that you think you're going to get cancer. And then you go online and you, you read about the horror stories about women who do develop cervical cancer. Mind you, most women will never develop cervical cancer from HPV, but um, there are a lot that would potentially develop cancer if they weren't doing something about it. So there's a substantial fear component and stress component to having HPV. So everybody wants to get rid of it. Um, they feel like if they don't get rid of it that, you know, their life is kind of somewhat over. Um, so I mean, there's that aspect of it. So, so understandably you want to first and foremost get rid of it, but it's far worse if you maintain an HPV infection and end up developing dysplasia, especially if you end up developing severe dysplasia. If, if, if it's bad, you know, it's bad enough having HPV, but then when you're looking at moderate or severe dysplasia and your doctor is insistent upon you, you know, cutting off part of your cervix to get rid of it and then starting to talk about cancer and, and sometimes, you know, if it, especially if it ends up being persistent dysplasia or you've already had a leap and it's coming back, then doctors will, you know, very quickly start talking about um, hysterectomy and cancer and things like that. So the fear component with dysplasia is, 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 is multiplied by 10, really, from HPV. So first thing, you want to get rid of HPV, um, and, and that really involves immune system function. So most of us know this. We know you're supposed to improve your immunity. Uh, there's all sorts of things on the internet about how to improve immunity. A lot of people are taking AHCC, and I did a video on my thoughts on AHCC and on mushrooms in general, some of the best things to help improve immune system function. And then other, you know, other things like even simple things that are inexpensive like vitamin C, um, things like diet have a major impact on immunity, gut function, probiotics. So there's a lot of things that will affect immune system function. 
you know, I see, I see women who, you know, almost every day, or I get contacted almost every day by women who are, you know, maybe only taking the immune side of it. So part of the reason I'm making this video is to not forget um, the other component of HPV, which is to prevent it from causing dysplasia. So immune system side of it, you need to be taking things that are immunostimulating or immunomodulating and, and modifying your diet and everything like that. That will help your immune system um, clear the virus and, and, and help it recognize the virus a little bit better. But the second component to HPV, which is not, maybe it's not talked about as much or thought about as much just simply because it's a little bit um, more difficult to understand if you don't have a background in molecular biology or in biochemistry or cell physiology or, or anything like that, but you want to prevent malignant transformation. In other words, while you have the HPV until it's gone, you want to be preventing it from causing dysplastic changes. And there's certain processes that are involved how the, you know, the HPV causes these dysplastic changes. So we know what these, we know what these processes are. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more just because it's a lot of people don't really understand the difference and what that all means. Um, so there's three main things that the virus does to cause dysplasia or precancer and eventually cancer for that matter. Now remember that again you could live out your entire life with HPV but if the only issue with that is if it's actually causing cancer. So if it's not causing cancer as as frustrating and as stressful as that is, that's, that's not really so much the issue. Now before I go over these three processes whereby HPV causes cervical dysplasia and cancer, I just want to um, touch, touch base again on the dysplastic continuum. So this is a page or a couple pages out of my book, Painting a Target on HPV. Um, but there's a continuum or a dysplastic or dysplasia continuum. You do not get cervical cancer overnight. It happens um, little by little. So if you look at uh, this chart, we see on the left of the chart, you have normal cells and those cells end up getting at some point potentially could get infected by HPV. So when you have HPV and it shows up positive on a test, what's happening is you have normal cells that are now HPV infected. So the HPV is inside of the cell taking over some of the machinery of the cell for reproduction. So the virus starts to reproduce itself. In doing that, in overtaking the cell and in reproducing itself, it causes malignant transformation. Um, so it's not like it's doing it intentionally, it's just a byproduct of the virus trying to re, uh, reproduce itself. But first, after you have HPV for some amount of time, if the virus goes unchecked, and under certain circumstances where maybe you're deficient in some sort of nutrients like folic acid and things like that, you'll start to develop mild dysplasia. So you don't go from a normal cell that's HPV infected to a malignant cell. You have to go through all the, the individual stages or the progression um, up to the point of, of malignancy. So the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to end up developing mild dysplasia and then if it's not checked, in some women, it'll develop into moderate dysplasia. And then again, in some women, if it continues unchecked, it's gonna develop, develop into severe dysplasia. And then eventually, um, again, in some women, not all women, it could end up developing into carcinoma. So there's this, con there's this continuum. So, you know, that can be confusing sometimes because especially when we don't do HPV co-testing in women under the age of 30, typically. So if you're under the age of 30, you're generally not going to know often not know that you have HPV until you have an abnormal pap because it's not normally tested. You'll have a pap done, but until the pap is abnormal, the doctor may not do an HPV test so you don't know. So that when you finally do have an abnormal pap and they automatically check for HPV at that point, you'll think that that's when you first had HPV. You're not going to always, most of the time, you're not going to know when you actually obtain the HPV infection. So you could have had the HPV infection for years at that point. And then so now you have mild dysplasia maybe on the pap and then the next year it could end up being moderate or severe dysplasia and your thinking is, and I hear this often, is that, well, it progressed really quickly. You know, I went from having uh, just HPV to, you know, moderate or severe dysplasia in, in a year. And the reality is, well, you don't always know that. First of all, we're not always doing paps yearly. We don't always do the HPV testing. So my point being, um, you don't always know um, whether it's progressing rapidly or not. For most women, it's going to tend to progress and go through this continuum um, somewhat rather slowly. 
So what are the three processes whereby HPV causes dysplasia? The first is um, inhibition of tumor suppression genes. So there's tumor suppression genes. What those are, they're um, sequences in the DNA of cells that, um, that really suppress, as the name implies, they suppress the development of cancer. So there's different types of tumor suppression genes like P53 and PRB and things like that. One of the things the oncogenes or the, the two kind of cancer causing genes that HPV possesses is the, this E6 and E7 oncogene, they actually, um, they actually suppress um, P53 tumor suppression gene and the PRB tumor suppression gene. So that's the first thing is the suppression of, or the inhibition of these tumor suppression genes. The second thing is oxidative stress, which is just free radical damage. Most of us are familiar with the ideas of free radicals and um, you know why antioxidants are healthy, for for instance, and why you know diets that are high in antioxidants are, are good for you and things like that and per cancer preventive. And then finally, the third thing is um, the the um, acceleration of uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. So vascular endothelial growth factor is a growth factor that allows for blood vessels to grow into an area. Um, you know that's part part and parcel to the development of cancer is that it needs you know more blood supply. So what the virus starts doing at some point is actually um, stimulating VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor so that you can the cell will end up kind of preparing itself for becoming more and more abnormal and becoming cancer. The way that we block malignant transformation is through diet and supplements. Now some of the supplements are different than you would take for immune stimulation, like alpha lipoic acid, CoQ10, resveratrol, um, DIM, curcumin, even just a general multivitamin, folic acid, all of those things are not so much to help your immune system get rid of HPV, they really are more to block malignant transformation. And the good thing about all of those, and I, you know, this is a page from my book where I, I go through the different, the research on how different plant substances block malignant transformation. The good thing is that, you know, all of these substances do all three. They block all aspects of malignant transformation. So alpha lipoic acid is a great antioxidant. It helps prevent free radical damage. So it blocks, you know, one of the three processes of malignant transformation, but it also upregulates um, tumor suppression genes and protects tumor suppression genes and it also inhibits VEGF so it helps block some of the new blood vessel growth that you would see with a developing tumor. Same thing with all of these. Again, for example, the reason that you would take uh, DIM or I3C is that uh, uh, sulforaphanes uh, upregulate P53 tumor suppression genes so DIM and I3C help protect the uh, tumor suppression genes. So those are the reasons you know, people go online and they look up different supplement regimens, so um, a lot of them are similar. So most people, again, you go online, you're going to find things about I3C and DIM and, and um, other supplements like that, um, but they don't really know why they're taking those supplements and the significance of it. And I think it's somewhat empowering to know why you're taking supplements and why you're spending the money on it and have at least some, at least some understanding or some rudimentary understanding of why you're spending all this money on different supplements and what the purpose of these supplements are. I hope you found this video informative and useful. If you did, give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like more information like this, please subscribe to my channel.